Okay, thank you. Uh, in addition to uh, being grateful to the conference organizers uh, for inviting me to, to come to Washington, D.C. from London today. Um, I'm also grateful for them for um, teasing out of me uh, some new thoughts, because when I received the invitation from Peter, Molly, and Sean, uh, I said, well, I'm, 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 it sounds like a great event, but I'm not sure how typical the discussions about human rights and access to medicines I'm not sure just how, how much we can learn from that for other fields of uh, IP or, or human rights uh, interface. So on the flight over, on the way over, uh, I had to think about that because uh, the conference organizers said, that's great, well, that, that's exactly why you should come because if, if you don't speak, if this tells us anything, then you should tell us why. Okay, so my task as the anchor speaker of this panel is to try and provide an overview uh, and give a narrative of the intersection between IP and human rights and then to try and link this in, in a way which will flag up some themes for the forthcoming um, panels uh, that we're going to have later today. So let me begin with IP and the right to health. Um, first, as the previous speakers have, have made clear, we're talking here primarily about uh, pharmaceutical products and uh, products which are protected by patents and the exclusionary effects that may result in terms of access to medicine. So I'll leave aside issues, uh, uh, parallel issues relating to um, trademark infringement and counterfeit goods and um, substandard medicines which might have health implications. So let's stick with the patents. So in terms of the interface between patents and access to medicines, essentially what we're talking about are the consequences of the rights conferred on the owner of a patent. And in Article 28 of the TRIPS Agreement, in Paragraph 1, it establishes a right of the patent owner to prevent third parties not having the owner's consent from certain acts, making, using, offering for sale, selling, or importing uh, for these purposes that product. Now, the justification for society granting these exclusive and potentially exclusionary rights is well rehearsed elsewhere, and I won't go into that. What I would like to show you are the, the utilitarian justifications for the granting of intellectual property rights. One of the issues which I think would, would be good to discuss with the human rights specialists over the next day would be the extent to which we should perhaps take a step back and not think only about the utilitarian justifications for the patent system, but to think perhaps more of natural rights justifications. Um, and in continental Europe, that's a much more, more common uh, approach. The utilitarian justification found here is not so evident in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, or in the Covenant from 1966, which talk more precisely about enjoying the benefits of scientific progress, um, etc. So concerns have been raised about the allocation of rights over intellectual property and the way that the granting of intellectual property rights can have significant and often unintended consequences on the enjoyment, enjoyment of other fundamental human rights. So the kind of, that's my introduction. What I wanted to do is really try and think about how this, these consequences um, can be categorized. So what I've suggested here and done in a different way in my book, Intellectual Property, Human Rights and Development, is to try and come up with thematic clusters of how um, a rights-based discourse has affected change um, in <laughs> terms of access to medicines. And I'll go through, the, I've got examples of, of these three um, thematic approaches. In terms of legislative change, Take, for example, the Indian Constitution. Now, although the Constitution does not provide explicitly for the right to health, the Indian Supreme Court has consistently interpreted 
the enjoyment of the right to life as including within its scope the right to health and access to the means by which health can be achieved. Furthermore, it was Article 21 of the Indian Constitution that underpinned the recommendation in 1959 by the Iyengar Committee on the Revision of Patent Laws in India to curtail the granting of patents in critical areas of food and medicine, which were then enshrined in Article, sorry, in Section 1, Subsection 1 of the Indian Patents Act. So this was the provision which um, facilitated the exclusion of patent patentable pharmaceutical products in India and led to the rise of the generic uh, drugs industry in that country. And it was a public interest human rights approach which led to that pr proposal for legislative change. Now, following implementation of the TRIPS agreement, as was explained earlier by Sean, um, the requirement that patents be available in all fields of technology led in 2005 to the repeal of Section uh, 5.1 of the Indian Patents Act. However, that wasn't the end of the story in India, because at the time of the amendments um, uh, leading up to 2005, a People's Commission comprising former government ministers, and retired members of the judiciary, and uh, activists examined again how the right to health enshrined in Article 21 of the Constitution of India could be used as the basis for supporting an introduction of what became Section 3D of the Patents Amendment Act of 2005, which specifies that the mere discovery of a new form of a known drug is not to be considered an invention, but that this should be regarded as such only if it enhances the efficacy of a known invention. So this is what was referred to earlier as uh, preventing the evergreening of known uh, pharmaceutical products. So what I'm arguing, therefore, is that legislative change in India was in effect, was effected by reference to a rights-based discourse in that country. So let's now turn to policy change. In Brazil, the right to health was enshrined um, following the return to democracy in that country in Article 196 of the Constitution. And it quickly became the focus of attention for HIV AIDS activists seeking to articulate the universal right of access to antiretroviral drugs. This in turn impacted on the federal and the municipal government's responsibility for healthcare delivery and contributed to the decision in Brazil to commence the provision of universal access of ARVs as early as 1990. And I've argued elsewhere that it was this policy of universal access in Brazil, uh, embedded in a human rights discourse, that also raises awareness about the relationship between patents, uh, pricing, and access to medicines, and uh, which ultimately contributed to uh, the compulsory license cases which occurred in that country later. Now, my third thematic approach was in relation to judicial interpretation. And here my example is South Africa. Many of you will already be familiar, familiar with the, the uh, so-called Neverapine case. This was uh, the parties with the Minister of Health and the Treatment Action Campaign. This was a complaint concerning the refusal of the South African government to make available Neverapine, a patented pharmaceutical, uh, via the public health sector, and the failure to set out a time frame for a national program to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV. The complaint was based on Articles 11, 27.1, and 28.2 of the uh, Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. And the complaint was upheld on these grounds by the Pretoria High Court in 2002. So here we see human rights being used in a judicial context to facilitate access to medicines in a developing country. So given these examples of the right to health, what else then can a rights-based discourse achieve in other policy areas 
outside our discussions about the right to health. So I would suggest that a rights-based discourse can and does act as a blocking mechanism. For instance, if we look at the, um, the rejection by the European Parliament on the 4th of July uh, 2012 of the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, the grounds for that rejection were that the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, particularly um, in the earlier drafts of ACTA, there had been provisions relating to the so-called graduated response or three strikes rule for disconnecting um, of, um, of users from the, by the internet service providers for uh, copyright violation. Um, this justification for rejection of that uh, was, was blocked effectively by Article 7 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, the right of privacy, and Article 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the right of protection of personal data. So there we see an example of human rights in relation to IP being used as a blocking mechanism for the ratcheting up of standards of IP protection and enforcement. My second example, um, and again I've, I've written about this elsewhere, is the extent that the right to work was used in India as the basis for farmers groups to resist the, the Indian government's attempts to uh, become signatories to the 1991 version of the Upov Convention on Plant Breeders' Rights. The particular concern was that the introduction of the Convention on Plant Breeders' Rights of 1991 would have severely restricted the ability of peasant farmers in India to save, reuse and exchange seeds without the consent of plant breeders like Monsanto. The use of a human rights discourse and the right to, to, to work, the right to practice any profession um, without restriction was used successfully as the basis for arguing that India should not go down that route. Okay. So next, in terms of emerging issues in the interface between IP and human rights, I'd suggest that what we should be asking is where in the debate about IP and access more widely than health, where have there been impacts um, which have been less evident, or where, where have there been few, a lower level of impacts? And here I've picked up two examples. Um, the first is in relation to uh, community rights over genetic resources and traditional knowledge. Now, this use of a, the, a rights discourse in relation to community rights of indigenous uh, and local communities in the developing world, somehow it failed to gain the same degree of traction in the TRIPS Council of the WTO on proposals for a, an amendment of the TRIPS agreement relating to the disclosure of origin of source materials in patent application uh, criteria. Nor has there been any substantive progress um, in terms of the WIPO Intergovernmental Committee on Generic, Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge and Folklore. So I think the question in relation to community rights is, can we infer from this that even when policy space exists, such as for the um, adoption of a disclosure requirement of any source material which is derived from traditional knowledge in patent applications, there can be no necessarily uh, repeat play of the successes achieved by the Global Access to Medicines campaign. Many people, uh, including Peter Drahos, Susan Sell, Amy Kapinski, have already written eloquently about the framing of the Access to Medicines campaign in terms of a rights discourse and the extent that this contributed to the achievement of a temporary waiver on um, uh, Article 31F <laughs> and uh, more specifically the <laughs> Declaration of 2001. And 
the existence of policy space and the engagement of rights space of the rights discourse doesn't necessarily seem to um, to be um, uh, a recipe for success. I think it's, it's perhaps an issue-specific um, uh, question that we have to be looking at. My second example here is that there's an apparent lack of focus on the rights to development. A number of the um, previous speakers on this panel have spoken about the utilization of flexibilities, such as the use of compulsory licenses, um, the definition of what constitutes a novel invention for the purposes of patentability criteria, and um, the possibility, possibilities of parallel importation of um, uh, patented goods. It's often said that the, the relative low levels of TRIPS flexibilities being used in the developing world can be um, attributed to the fact that there is um, very little emphasis in terms of the IP-related technical assistance, particularly prov provided multilaterally by uh, WIPO. Um, there's very little emphasis on how to facilitate the utilization of these flexibilities in developing countries. The technical assistance is much more focused traditionally on uh, IP protection and IP enforcement. And this is something that I've discussed with Peter Drahas on a number of occasions. We wonder why it is that there has been um, relatively little uh, engagement with the right to development as, um, as a mechanism for uh, trying to, to, to lever or lever the, the development-oriented uh, aspects of IP-related technical assistance. So it's the existence of the right is here in uh, Article 1.1 of um, the 86 resolution, and is, is more explicit here, I think, in Article 3, which talks about the responsibility of states in terms of the realization of the rights to development. So that seems to be absence from the discussion at the moment. Okay, so moving forward, uh, and I'll conclude shortly. So what I'd like to end with are a number of, of questions. Um, the first of these, as follows. Are there issue-based reasons for different outcomes when we look at the interface between IP and human rights? We'll take, for example, my comment about community rights and traditional knowledge and the patenting of um, source material derived from indigenous peoples, where there's been no policy, substantive policy progress comparable to that in terms of the access to, access to medicines campaign. Secondly, have the contest contestations involving the relationship between IP and human rights changed over time? So perhaps it isn't an issue-based problem at all. Perhaps it's to do with windows of opportunity and the way that the policy agenda moves. Perhaps it's a temporal nature of the issue and, and that opportunities are are uh, hard to come by. And third, um, perhaps it's coming back to the justifications for um, the granting of intellectual property rights. And over time, is it perhaps simply the case that the nature of the rights which are granted and the justification for those rights have changed? <laughs> so, have our very notions of inventorship and creativity actually, if we take a particularly a natural rights approach, have they lost their original connection with the self, the individual uh, who is the lone inventor, the author of creative works, um, who is, has ownership of these creations and inventions? Is the corporatization of intellectual property changing the nature of the debate over time. And that leads me to my conclu concluding remark, and then I'll show you my two last slides. Is it really the case that perhaps the way that we understand the justifications for intellectual property rights have impacted on the way that we perceive how those rights then interface with other fundamental human rights? Um, due to the corporatization of intellectual property. And 
my conclusion is really just to show you two comments by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which make a substantive distinction between intellectual property rights which are utilitarian in purpose, providing the incentives for creativity, which ultimately benefits society, and that these are contrasted with the inalienable human rights, which are permanent, which are granted to individuals. And it seems that it's this um, fundamental distinction between how we understand the nature of intellectual property rights in the context of their interface with other fundamental human rights, which perhaps leads to a, a crossover into other the thematic areas which take us beyond the right to health. So I hope I've raised some issues of debate for this panel and for the remainder of the, today's deliberations. Uh, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.